try and click the clicker here. There, see that's me. Uh, that's where I work. And this is probably the most important thing you need to know is down here, my email address. Because if you get a dart, when you get a dart, you're probably going to want example spectra, or at least my libraries. Absolutely. And in order to get those, you're going to have to ask me nicely on your letterhead. And then I get to probably upload it to Joel's FileX account, and then you can download it because it's actually getting to be a fairly large file with all the libraries in it. And you'll see those this afternoon. We, we've got them all here. Um, Roger was able to get them all loaded on the computer downstairs. I didn't actually check that part, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that it's going to work. We'll see. Um, so anyways, uh, let's get started. I'm going to go through a bunch of stuff here. Some of this is... is um, some of this is, is training materials that I use to train my people, so I thought it would work here. Uh, and some of this stuff you've already heard before, but I thought I'd throw a glossary of terms at you just to start out. And I don't want to go through all these in detail, but you at least now have a reference. You can get your magnifying glass out and read those little slides on there. Uh, Accutoff, we've already talked about that. And you know, Chip, obviously, you can stop me whenever I make a mistake about something I'm talking about here, and we'll get... That's the, that's the problem with having the inventor here, you know? I mean, think about that. It's just a little intimidating. It is. <laughs> not much. So anyways, the Akitoff and the Dart, we've talked about that. Orifice 1, uh, Chip talked quite a bit about how that, how that works. And I'm going to discuss more about the CID function of that uh, because we use that in, in, for all of our samples for our, in our screening technique. Uh, profile spectrum, we looked at that, the multiple data points. Centroiding is, is your the math that goes on to try to find where the middle of that peak is. And there's, there's criteria that are in the software. And I'm going to be showing you, because I don't have the Schrader software, I'm going to be showing you Mass Center. So I don't know if the Alabama people ordered Schrader software or not. Don't know? OK, so we, you may need to really look at this Mass Center stuff and, and have a lot of fun with that. Uh, PEG 600 is our internal calibration. We saw spectra of that this morning. Uh, and then internal mass calibration is how is using that PEG 600 file within each data file in order to calibrate your mass axis in order to make sure that you know that if you get a peak at 304.1549 that that is in fact cocaine or scopolamine uh, and not other not something else. All right, uh, some other terms that we're going to discuss: function switching. In the Mass Center software, function switching allows you to choose. I don't know how many, but we use four different orifice voltages, and we, we collect four different TICs every second. So we're going to switch orifice voltages every quarter second, collect spectra at each orifice voltage, save that all in a file, and then you've got, you thought you had data before. You'll have reams of data after this. And some of it is useful, and some of it's not, and we'll, we'll kind of discuss some of that too. Protonated and deprotonated molecules, those are the proper terms for the M plus H thing and M minus H thing that you see. Uh, millimass unit, uh, Chip talked about that. The Joel DX file over here is the um, text delimited file that's saved in the mass center, okay, in the mass center software to be able to then use that in other applications like the elemental composition that we saw. Uh, and especially the search from list program that you'll see in a few minutes. Speaking of search from list, uh, another Dr. Cody program that is just terrific, absolutely wonderful program, and, and you'll see that in use this afternoon. Uh, drugs Neutral Masses is a library of empirical formula of drugs, and that's something that I've, I've got 550 or so compounds in my list now. And so if you request my library, you will get that or whatever, whatever update of that will be available at that time. And I add things to it all the time. As more things come up, drugs, other useful things, excipients, things like that that you might find um, that would be helpful when you, when you search those spectra. Uh, but drugs neutral masses is used in the search from list program. Uh, drug prep library. Orifice 20, Drug Standard Library, Orifice 20, they both do the same thing. Uh, these are my, my standard spectra that I've been working on for a year or so. And uh, the, the standard library are the primary standards that we have. And I've got, I don't have too many of those in there. And then um, 
more importantly is the pharmaceutical standards here in which we've taken, you know, we've got, I don't know, 400 and some pharmaceutical standards in our standards room and we had one of our nice lab techs go in there and take a sample out of each one of those to be then put through the DART process here under, you know, with the function switching and everything. And that's been what has created then these libraries to be able to give out to other people and that we'll, we will have available if you, if you request them. Uh, the mirror spectrum is something that you'll see and it's, it's a display you'll see in search from list where you'll have your, your known spectrum on the top and then a mirror of the, of the library hit on the bottom so you can compare those spectra uh, one to one rather than having an overlay they're, they're just mirrored upside down. Okay. And if anybody has a question, let me know. I have the microphone right here, and I'll just hand you the microphone so we can go through that. Okay, so let's talk about what we do. Now, DFS, uh, Department of Forensic Science, we've had this instrument since, uh, well, November of 2006. Uh, operationally, it, we finally got it operational in, in uh, February of 2007, and we can talk about what an, a cracked MCP is. Um, Maybe over dinner sometime, but um, <laughs> suffice it to say that it took a long time to figure out what was wrong with this instrument when it was first installed, and and you know the Joel people worked very diligently, and and um, it was a very interesting process. I have been in that flight tube. I have been in there cleaning those those ion optics inside the flight tube, uh, you know, up under the pusher plate and things like that, and. You know, I mean, that's pretty scary stuff. And to see one of these, one of these Japanese engineers in there and, and watching him change the MCP place. Now, these are $5,000 pieces of equipment here that you're putting in. And, you know, I mean, the sweat was dripping down his, his brow because you could tell that he, you know, he did not want to mess this up. And, and I don't blame him because it's fairly delicate. So having to change those is not something for the light of heart and, and uh, you know, I would definitely get a, a, a trained technician to be able to do that. Uh, but anyway, suffice to say, we went through all kinds of iterations trying to develop our use for this. And, and you'll find this out here now that you own one. Now you've got to figure out what the heck am I going to do with this darn thing, you know? Uh, it's like anything else, all these other gadgets that you have. You know, your cell phone has 63 different functions on it, and you use two because those are the ones you like to use. And the other... 61 of them are like, you know, well, that sounds really cool, but I'm not sure that's neat. Well, th we went through a long time trying to figure out what are we going to do with this instrument? How are we going to apply it to our work? We spent $220,000 on this thing. What's it do for us? So we went through a number of things like how to sample, um, and then, you know, we'd go along, we'd collect spectra, and we'd start this library, and then something else would come up, like we learned about function switching, like in the middle of last year, it was like, wow, we can do that? And then it was, you know, off we went and started over again and, and started doing things. So, um, a lot of the groundwork that if any of you all, and you, you have one, but if any of you all get a, a dart, you know, remember that email address and that phone number? You know, call me because I might have already done a lot of the stuff that you're going to want to go through to, to get to that point. And, you know, hopefully I can give you some pointers and hopefully you'll hear something here today that will help you out with that. So, anyways, the biggest thing is sampling. You know, how do you take, oops, how do you take all these drugs? And this, this was just a real small portion of a case that we had that, that was the perfect example of a, of a use for a, a dart. And unfortunately, it, it, the case actually turned up about a year and a half before we even got the thing. But I had all the pictures, so I thought I'd put it in there. But there were, I don't know, there were like 400 different drugs in this case. And we went through and, and had to separate out. We separated them all out by color first, and then we separated them all out by, by you know, capsules and tablets. And then we went through. And anyway, so this is, this is the kind of yellow to red area. Um, and... Um, that would have been the perfect case for this for the dart because you know you got tablets. Some of them are marked, and we, we did you know we were able to identify most of them through their markings, but some of them weren't. And boy, how nice it would have been to be able to just screen those things and just you know say what the heck's in here. So that's one application that that um, I think you'd really find is is important. Um, so all these different things we'll, we're going to talk about 
um, types of samples, sampling methods, and then we'll talk about function switching, calibration. I think Susan? Yeah, she asked me about that. So we're going to talk some more about that. Okay. Um, so sampling methods, you know, it, it, keep it simple. You know, you, you, you want to do a headspace, just open the vial up, hold it near the stream, and you get a mass spectrum. You know, it's kind of like Peter talking about ethyl acetate. In his lab, you know that, that if you've got it anywhere near the near the the top while it's running, you get a nice peak for ethyl acetate. Well, it's the same thing. If you've got a head, you know a liquid and you want to do a headspace on it, just open the vial and hold it up there. It's so simple. That's and you know then you have to process the data, but the sample collection is incredibly easy. Um, so that's you know that's not much to that. Um, solid samples. All right. So we've got. Um, a little chunk of, of hydro, cocaine hydrochloride here. Um, the proverbial, <clears throat> I probably shouldn't say that, we published here, a uh, heroin <laughs> um, sample, and then uh, some marijuana here. Well, you can take this thing and, you know, Chip and, and the, uh, the Joel website will tell you, you can solid samples. It's really terrific. Well, yes and no because there's some there's some considerations that you've got to have when you're sampling a solid like this and you can see that this is not a homogeneous kind of mixture here this is this is pretty messy this kind of thing and although this was some nice hydrochloride that I kind of put together a few years back uh, and it's actually quite pure you know you don't know that going in that you know where what the origin of this is and what it's mixed with, and here you've got this thing, and you you know just want to know what is it, and so it's really hard to 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 kind of you know just figure that out. And of course marijuana, you know that's you know I mean you've got the leaf, you've got the stalk, you've got the stems, you've got a little bit of everything, and the non homogeneity of the sample is really what kind of nails you on this. Um, one of our chemists had some ice crystals, really pretty little crystals, but they were mostly dimethyl sulfone. Okay, and um, so we took the crystal, and, and it, was a, it was a nice big chunk, and, and we took some tweezers, and we held it into the, into the dark beam. And I'm watching, as the data collection was going on, I'm watching the spectrum, and, and he was in there, you know, sampling this stuff. And all you could see was a dimethyl sulfone peak, and then all of a sudden, boom, up pops a meth peak. And that just shows you that there was a lot of dimethyl sulfone, and then all of a sudden you finally got to the meth and then you saw it. So that sampling technique, you know, you could miss the main drug if you didn't know to hold it in there a little bit longer until you got, you know, burned off that outside. You know, so that and then, you know, we look at things like coated tablets. You know, you've got to burn off that coating or get to the middle before you're actually sampling the, the um Material of interest, so that can be a real a real issue, and um, you know going back to, to to this screen, you know solid sampling with using tweezers, yeah you can do that, but understand there's some ma major drawbacks to that. So, um, some some blotter paper here. It wasn't LSD. It was actually the four chloro two five dimethoxy amphetamine, and. Um, you know, this is a good example of, of what happens in the dart stream. We run ours at 275 degrees. It's just where it started, and that's where we've had it, and we haven't changed it. So that's where we're married to now, because that's where all of our standard spectral library is built. So, um, but that 275 degrees will char that paper pretty good. And, you know, so that's, once again, it's another, another little drawback. But, you know, don't get me wrong, you can get a nice spectrum doing that, right off of the blotter paper, just like that. Uh, coated tablets, you know, and, and then regular tablets, you know, this stuff just gets messy. I mean, these things don't have, there's, there's just not one ingredient in there. There's a bunch of stuff in there, and you hope, you would hope that these nice pharmaceuticals are, in fact, homogeneous in the way they're mixed, and then they go into the tablet presses and, and do all that. But you're only hoping that, and hope that you get that part in the dark beam. And we saw a great example of that this morning by whoever was doing the, the the dollar the ten dollar bill in there, you know at some point you got a lot of cocaine and others you didn't and that's a good example of an of an inhomogeneous uh, sample. So we tried some other things the dry down tube method and um, I made that that great loading block there where you can put all these little capillary tubes in there and and um, 
you know, you take a syringe, and I think I've got pictures of that. You take a syringe, and you can load a microliter of a liquid sample onto each one of your little tubes. Well, that's all well and good. If you look really, really hard, you can see right about above that little dot right there. You can see how far the sample ran down. So you get, you know, I mean, that's only a microliter of liquid, but you'd be surprised, you know, how far that runs. And that's out of methanol, so, it, you know, not much surface tension there to kind of hold it on the end. So we even tried turning the loading block upside down and loading it with the, with the tubes hanging down. And that was okay, but it still wasn't all that great. And one of the experiments we did was we had four different people come in, and they had all used the dart before. They all knew how to do it. And I had four different people load tubes with the same solution and a microliter of each solution and then had them as we our, our fun term is wanding the uh, capillary tubes in the in the dart stream uh, so I had them wand those into the dart stream and we looked at response of each of the peaks and it wasn't consistent because some people were you know better able to load onto these um, you know when you put that in the gas stream you've got to kind of get it in there just right and there's, you know, there's some issues that you've got to overcome to be able to get this, you know, to be consistent. And Peter will tell, tell you more tomorrow about using the auto dart, which is going to help with that sampling because it's much more consistent than having this human person in here messing around. So this didn't work all that well. We, didn't, we decided we didn't like that all that well. Plus the manipulation of having to draw off a microliter and put it on there, really kind of, kind of a pain. So the best thing, oh, and then the other one was, was um, just taking the uh, syringe and you drop a microliter in there and then you squish it out the end and hold that in the, in the gas stream. That sounded like a grand idea, except we use four liters per minute of helium coming out of there. And what tends to happen is that this little, this little droplet gets blown all over the face of the orifice here and not necessarily ionized it in the hole. So once again, inconsistency. So, so these are the things, and you know, I hope this will help you when you get this, that you, know, you won't have to go through a lot of this. Some of this stuff is going to be taken care of. But I'd like you to try each of these things. If you get a dart, try this stuff, because if you get better results than I did, call me up, because I want to know. But these, didn't, these were some that didn't work all that well. So our standard operating procedure now is to take our sample, if you have a solid sample, a drug, powder, tablet, capsule, dump a little bit of the capsule out, a little bit of, the, of, you know, and you take and chunk off a piece of a tablet or just take some powder like you would normally representatively uh, sample any of your powders or anything that you've got. Drop it in an auto sampler vial, put in a half a mil of methanol, and dip a, a um, capillary tube, a, a melting point tube, into the liquid and then transfer that right into the gas stream. And that is our preferred method. And the best thing is that because you're, you're sampling out of a liquid, anything that was, dis, that, that was dissolvable in that solvent is going to be in there and you'll see it on the dart. If it then will ionize and, you know, there's other, obviously other things that go along with that. But um, for sampling itself, that's probably the best. So the key to this thing is that dart sampling by hand is an art. And I'm just hoping you have a good sense of humor because <laughs> it took me a long time to do that. <laughs> and consistency from one person to the next is difficult to obtain. And, and Peter will tell you more tomorrow about the auto dart, which is down here. And we haven't ponied up the money to buy that yet, although there's some rumblings about some grant money that's floating around that might be used for that. So I think I'd rather have the experiment table first because that sounds like it's more useful but but anyway sampling by by hand is an art you've already experienced that in the in the half an hour this morning you saw how you know it's just not always easy to get the dollar bill in the right spot and to get it to give you what you need and not block the orifice and things like that but let me say that beyond that you know I've got all the people in my lab being you know able to use this instrument and doing well enough to be able to get really good results with it. So it's possible it takes practice. And it's no different than having to learn how to fill out a sequence table on an Agilent 
5973 and be able to run your sequence. You have to you had to learn somewhere along the line how to do that. And it's the same thing here. Anyways, love that. Anyway, all right, function switching. Um, we taught, we, one of the terms that we have to remember is, is protonated and deprotonated molecules. That's the primary piece of information that you want to get from this experiment, from the DART. Uh, you can do an awful lot, as you saw, with the elemental composition program uh, to be able to determine what the elemental composition of this particular ion is. And once you have that information, then you've gone a long way to identifying, or in our sense, in screening for what the components are. And then this, the next step beyond that, though, is that the dart at low orifice voltages, as, as was mentioned this morning, doesn't give you a lot of fragmentation. So there's not a lot of information here. It's kind of like doing electrospray. You know, I don't know, I, I use the uh, Agilent 1100 and it was just quite the single quadrupole system, and you know you had the fragmenter voltage on there, and that was the the in source CID that allowed you to have some fragmentation um, in the in the spectrum. If you didn't raise that fragmenter voltage, then you got essentially an M plus H. You got the protonated molecule, and that was it. And that's okay once again, but that's that's not all the information that you're searching for. So. What do we do? Collision-induced dissociation, and I stole this one from the, this is the mass spec um, terms. There was a, there's a whole program to get standardized terms for mass spectrometry, um, and I stole this off of their website. Um, an ion-neutral species interaction where the projectile ion is dissociated as a result of interaction with target species. So this is basically the same thing you're going to do in a triple stage quad, okay, in a, in a triple stage quad, you're going to have a collision cell in the middle and you're going to break that, that ion apart and then analyze what you have after that. Well, we're going to do all that right up here in the, in the front of this, so it is kind of up front CID if you've heard that term before. Um, if you think back to, to electron impact, um, your typical mass specs, you know, your quadrupoles, you know, the high vacuum prevents that. Uh, because your mean free path is long enough that you don't have any collision and you don't want that because that would be bad, right? Because all of our, all of our EI spectra, our NIST library, our Wiley's, our, our AAFS library, all those that you may have, you know, would be really kind of messy if you had um, this kind of thing going on. So we try to prevent ion molecule interactions in, in that technique. And here, we want it to happen because that's going to give us the information that we need to be able to, to have um, a better understanding of what we've got. So basis behind the triple stage quads, commonly used in LCMS, uh, and it's very simple on this particular instrument because, as Chip explained, it's just a potential difference between those two orifices, orify, and, um, you know, we, we can get nice fragmentation. So let's look at some examples. Um, here's our good friend, cocaine. And I apologize that the mass axis is probably not as good as it should be. It should be 1549. Yeah. Um, but here it is at orifice, orifice 1 of 15 volts. And you'll notice we have a little tiny 182, which you are all, anyone who's done any drug chemistry work, recognizes the cocaine spectrum. Am I correct with that? Does everyone here feel comf comfortable with an EI, ma EI mass spectrum of cocaine? Um, so if we go to 30 volts then, we start seeing that particular ion getting a little bit bigger. As we go to 45 volts, you notice this one, but then you also start noticing some other ions that are also very characteristic of that cocaine spectrum, the 272, the 150. When we get to 60 volts, it starts to look pretty doggone EI-like. We have our 82 coming up, our 119, and, and the 150 in here, the big 182, of course, and remember that what we're doing is we're fragmenting this one. So this one keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually it's going to go away because we've got too much energy in there for this one to stay together long enough to make it into the mass spec. Think about it in those terms. Now, um, 
If you went higher than this in orifice voltage, you'll see even more peaks show up. These will be a little bit bigger, and it'll look pretty EI-like. It's very interesting how, how the spectra will, will you know, become familiar after a while. All right, so function switching. We're going to actually set up uh, Roger's instrument this afternoon to do this so that we can hopefully be able to produce this kind of data this afternoon and, and give you some examples of, of that. But we go into the method acquisition editor, which is actually in the Mass Center main screen, where you have the little stop button. And we choose to add four TOF functions in there. Um, somewhere back along the line, we set up four different tune files. And each of those tune files, the only difference in those tune files is the orifice voltage. And we do 20, 30, 60, and 90 volts. And you're probably going to ask, why did you choose that? And it was like, those sound good. <laughs> and as it turns out, they're really good in many, many cases because there are quite a few drugs that, that give you a nice protonated molecule at 20 volts. There's a bunch of drugs that fall apart at 20 volts. So that was pretty good. And then the 30 volts and the 60 volts really start to begin to give you fragmentation on many different molecules. And by the time you get to 90, some of the molecules don't stay together enough to be able to give you much information at all. They're just little ions at that point because they've broken up too much. So we really span the range here in these four voltages. We really span the range of, of different fragmentation patterns. And it really applies nicely over a broad range of, of drugs. And you'll see there's going to be some difficulties with that, though, and some that, that don't necessarily work as well. So this just picked out um, four spectra. Here's noscopene. You know, you find that in heroin samples a lot. It's usually pretty small. Um, it's also an opium, right? It's one of the things that you identify in opium. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you look at an EI spectrum of this, you're going to be hurting to try and find a molecular ion to be able to, you know, if, if, you, if you have criteria that you need to have a molecular ion in your spectrum to identify something, you're going to be really hurting to be able to see that. You'll see this nice 220 peak, and then you might see, you know, a little tiny peak up here. But if you, <laughs> we just went through this, and, and I was like, well, just run it on the dart. You get beautiful protonated molecules. You know, there they are. It's just CI, right? Right? Everybody familiar with that? Chemical ionization. We do that all the time. Anyways, here's, here's what this spectrum looks like, though, over those four voltages. And remember that each one of these was collected um, every second. Okay, so there's four spectra collected every second. And then I guess as Chip said that there's also multiple spectra that would be averaged within each one of those spectra to give that spectrum. So you've got a lot, you know, there's a lot of work going on here. Uh, but you see how the fragmentation really starts to come up in here. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff here. We're not to the point yet of being able to use the DART ionization as a confirmation technique. But we're, we're approved for using it for screening. Our forensic board approved that back in May. And the next step, though, is to look at all the parameters that are going to go into being able to say, you know, is this a confirmation tool? Can we use it as a confirmation tool? Is it applicable for enough drugs to make it worthwhile? The other side of the coin is for those things like, you know, how many people love to have a, get a molecular ion for methylphenidate? I mean, you know, there's another one. Does it give a molecular ion? How about fentanyl? There's another toughie, right? Because you usually have a little bit and, and, you know, doing EI spectra of that, it's very difficult to get a molecular ion. But you really like to have that because that's, very useful information if you're identifying something. Well, put that in, a, in the dart and you get these beautiful protonated molecules. And how can you dispute that? You will, I know. <laughs> OK, think about it. These are things you need to think about. All right, so running a sample on the dart. Now, this is the way we, we run our samples at DFS. Uh, first thing we do is, in a, this is our, our TIC here. Um, and you notice it says ESI plus in there. That's, that's a mass center uh, function. Okay? It thinks it's ESI because it just doesn't know. It, it really doesn't know that there's a dart out there. We won't get into that. And so this is our TIC. This is one run, one data file. 
And within that data file, we have our polyethylene glycol peaks. Okay? So um, we can do our internal uh, data file calibration. We're going to calibrate the mass axis and make sure that it is, in fact, where it's supposed to be. The next set of three peaks here is our lock and check standards. We use cocaine to lock, and then we check with, with meth, meth, yeah, methamphetamine at the low end and nefazadone at the upper end. And you wonder, why, you know, nefazadone, wow. Well, it's just because it gives you a nice protonated molecule at 470.2323. So that's in the upper end of our mass range. We scan from 600 down to 66. Um, and then methamphetamine at 150.1283, uh, that's our low end check. So we're going to lock on the, on the cocaine in the middle, okay? And this is this drift compensation that, that Chip alluded to about using a, a known ion to be able to lock your mass axis. So this is, a, is actually another level of calibration that's added beyond doing PEG. Then we also lock and check, and then we run our samples and look at our samples, okay? So we put a lot of things in there to try to, to, try to make sure that, you know, what we're looking at is what we think we're looking at and where we're supposed to be. So then we run our sample. And, you know, there, I show things done three times. We usually do them at least two. But, you know, uh, two, three times, you know, kind of whatever. And you always like to leave a little gap in between. And as Peter will tell you, you know, it's <laughs> if you run multiple samples within a data file, you've got to figure out which ones go with which sample. There's no barcode reader to be able to know that this is this sample and this is that sample. And I'll hear about that tomorrow, I think, hopefully, about the, uh, with the auto dart and how that works. Um, and then there's three more um, peaks over here, and that's just more peg. And the idea there is that when I ran this, I really didn't like the intensity levels here, and I thought, well, let me see if I can get a little more intensity levels because intensity matters, okay? And um, especially doing function switching. Function switching, you get a lot and you give away an awful lot. And what you give away is sensitivity because you're splitting your signal into four different TICs. And believe me, you lose sensitivity. You lose a lot of it as you, as you get into to adding more and more of these um, functions. It might be better to only do three, 20, 60, 90. That might be a good combination. We haven't gotten there. We're just we're still using it because we haven't seen it fail us terribly yet. You might have to concentrate your sample down a little bit more, but you know, these are things that you can work with. All right. So is that the right one? Yeah. This this page we'll see um, this afternoon. This is our, our PEG um, spectrum here. This is our reference table and this is our calibration that, that was similar to what the Schrader software gave you this morning. Um, there's actually two uh, PEG calibration files that are run. There's a global calibration that's done, and I do this after cleaning. I always check. I put the, the uh, spray source on, uh, which the Acutoff comes with an electrospray source, by the way, for, for tuning. Okay, so keep that in mind, you know, that if you happen to have an LC sitting next door and need a nice TOF to be able to do some LC TOF work, keep that in mind. You actually have it. It comes with a spray source. It's terrific. Um, but we put that on there, and then we do a global mass calibration. And that's kind of, you know, that, that gets everything in the ballpark when you first pull up the data. Then you do, within your data file, you do PEG again. And that's your external standard that goes in, um, um, in within your data file itself. And then you get a, your calibration curve like this, and you determine whether that curve is, is a good curve or a bad curve, good data, bad data, and there's criteria for that. And Chip actually talked about that in the Schrader software, and it's basically the same idea here uh, with your residual values here being over 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 10. And we typically get better than that. Um, but then that is all then applied to your data. And then we do a lock mass on top of that. So there's actually three levels of calibration that we use in order to make sure that mass axis is what we say it is. All right, so Peggy the Dimetrodon, because, you know, that love that. You know, you saw that back here. 
that dimetrodon shape. It's just terrific. Anyways, Peggy sits there and overlooks our instrument. Um, intensity matters, and you know why that matters is is because you want to you know you, you need to get the best calibration data you possibly can. And if you look at the battle of good peg versus bad peg, um, you know if you don't have enough ions to work with, you you know as in anything else, you know you, you, when you're evaluating your own EI spectra. You know, you've got to sit there and, and, you know, do I have isotope peaks on there? Are these, are these strong enough to be able to use this data? Is this a good spectrum? Well, this one is not so good. This one's nice and good. And, you know, the idea here being we've got a lot more intensity on this lower spectrum than we do on the upper one. So that's why going back and, and you know, throwing a couple extra pegs in at the end of your run, if you still have time before your, before your, your stop time on your, on your data file, you know, throw a couple extra pegs in there because, you know, if you can pull up a better calibration, I mean, you know, all this is a known. This is not, you know, kind of voodoo stuff here. It's all known. But if you've, if you've got good data to work with, you'll have good data at the end. So that's another thing. Peter and I have been bantering this back and forth about, you know, do you take an average across the entire peak, the entire response, or do you only take the better part of the peak? And to me, you take the better part of the peak because you get better intensity here rather than averaging in these low responses here. You get better intensity here. And then we subtract a background spectrum from each. Okay, so we average the peak, we average the background, and we subtract that averaged background from the averaged peak. Make sense? Lots of math. Okay, 30 volt data, profile, and centroid as we go from one to the other. So 6120 to 23,000. If we average across here and then take the same background average, we've got roughly half the intensity and you know, roughly maybe a little bit more than half the intensity when we centroid that. So which one would I rather choose? I would rather choose this one before here and have a better intensity uh, set of peaks to work with when doing my calibration. All right. Okay. Uh, some of the issues with peak intensity. You know, if signal to noise is huge in this, and it's being able to find uh, a centroid of this. Now, centroiding. You you want to find the middle of this peak. All right. In order to be. be well, step back a second. You're going to take this profile data and turn it into a regular histogram like you're used to seeing, which is just a single bar that will represent the intensity of this peak at the mass somewhere down along here where it's supposed to be. Okay? So if you look at this peak here, it's very difficult when you consider the, the interfering peak here and the tailing that's going on. It's very difficult if you were to, to look from here to here, where's the middle of that? Somewhere over here. So if you come up to the top of this though and only look at this upper part of this peak, well then you would probably assign this mass much more correctly. This one here, certainly you could assign the mass very easily because it's a much taller peak and finding the middle of that is much easier. Now the mass center software, the way I've got it set up, it actually takes and goes 50% up the peak gets rid of the bottom, the foot as they call that, and only centroids then the upper part of that. And that way it can find that middle of that peak much easier. And Chip talked about you know, some of the, the tailing here. There could be interference, a um, little bit of kinetic energy spread from the TOF. Um, you know, you'll see that in these, in these TOF peaks. But this here, If you find something in there that you, that you need to look at more closely, you might want to back off and do a single orifice voltage run and look at that data again, and you might get then better data. But centroiding with, with um, low-intensity peaks is, is a bit difficult.
Okay, so then the lock mass and check standards. Um, as I said, I use a, a mixture of cocaine, methamphetamine, and nefazidone. And they span the mass range. We use the cocaine as the drift compensation in the very middle, and we assign that at this value of 1549. And then the methamphetamine and the, and the fazidone cover the low and high ends. And once again, another level of calibration. And then we actually print this particular piece of data out and put that in our, in our case files so that that can be evaluated by somebody else that within this data file that you were able to get your mass axis correct. We don't save the calibration because that could be regenerated because it's still part of the data file itself. But we do print out and have for... Um, for observation by somebody else who's reviewing the case file, we do have this, this um, um, lock mass and check standards printed out. Okay, so there's what, that, there's what it looks like. Nothing, you know, I mean, it's just a, it's just a straight up mixture of these three drugs. And um, it's, it's really nice because it spans, like I said, we, we run from 66 to, to 600. So it really gives us a look at the entire mass range and make sure that we're calibrated all the way through. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sample data. Um, sample is, is average, centroid, and the calibrations are applied for each of the orifice voltages. The, um, the spectra are then saved in the Joel DX format. Anyone have an idea what this might be? Just from looking at that? Remember, protonated molecules. Something at 323 ring a bell? See, that's where you people got to get out of the EI mode and start thinking, you know, that protonated molecule. How about LSD? Excellent. Who said that? Ugh, cheater. All right, LSD. Okay, search from list program. Any questions so far? This is kind of a little breaking spot here. Okay. We all set? All right, search from list program. Uh, another um, Chip Cody program here, and this is this is our bread and butter for what for what we do for all of our of our samples, because we'll put it in here and and run it through our list of of spectra, and run it again, search it against our empirical formula list, and if it's within our mass tolerance levels, you know we're going to get something labeled, and we can go from there. At least gives us an idea. And when we're talking about this as a screening method, this is incredibly important. And if you have peaks in here that are within 5 millimass units or whatever your tolerance levels are, of something in your list, it's going to give you a label. And that's one of the things where you have to think because you have to kind of say to yourself, you know, if I've got trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, well, that makes sense to me, but is there nicotinamide actually in there? Or is that just a labeled peak because it happened to come up? And that's where you've got to go through and do a little more looking at that point. All right, so this being a workshop, I'm going to go through the little deal of what a bunch of this stuff is because we're going to actually see this in a little while down in the lab. So... Uh, first thing you'll do is you'll load your data file using that particular button. And then you'll load your empirical formula library. And in this case, it's the drug's neutral masses, which, like I said, there's, there's over 550 different uh, empirical formula in there now. Uh, let's see. And then you adjust the, the threshold and mass tolerance to suit your, your search. This threshold is um, percent of base peak. So if you've got itty-bitty little tiny peaks, then you might want to drop it down to 1% or 2% so that you're looking at, at even some of the little peaks. But you don't want to get it too small because some of the grass and noise will show up and, and you'll get hits with that and you'll get all confer confused and that's not good. Mass tolerance, we typically look at 5 millimass units or less for all of our searching, for all of our, of our screening method. Uh, the instrument's capable of better than that, but that's about where we uh, typically are. And in fact, we won't accept any data that's, that's greater than that. You either run it again, or your calibration's off, or you've got interference, or any of the above. But something's wrong. Okay? Uh, let's see. Add or subtract from the empirical formula. If you're doing positive ion work, you're going to add a hydrogen. 
But if you're doing negative ion work, you might want to subtract a hydrogen. If you are doing some derivatization, like with ammonia, which is kind of fun, you just take a, a cotton tip swab and dip it in some ammonium hydroxide, and you hold it under the dart, and then you do your sample. And you can do ammonia addicts with it. It's terribly cool. I'll show you some data. Uh, but you can actually choose ammonia here as your charge carrier um, uh, and actually see if you, could, if you have ammonia addicts in your spectrum. And I think Chip's got some more modifications to this that, that he was talking about before. But anyways, this, this is the, the one we currently have. So then you do empirical formula search. And then we also have this match spectra search, this little icon up on top up here, and that's going to be really important. I'll show you that in a, in a second. But that's the one that's going to then take your spectrum that you created and search that against your library spectra or our library spectra. Okay, so this is what the output looks like. Um, the search hit for the empirical formula match, this, is, um, this was that same spectrum that we looked at before. You, know, you can't tell the difference between LSD and LAMPA lampa lysergic acid methyl propyl um, you know the empirical formulas are exactly the same and you know there's nothing here that, to be able to, to differentiate them uh, one of the things that I have in there in, the, in your um, Excel spreadsheet that has the empirical formula list in there you can actually put in other data other information out in this last uh, in I guess the C field and um, these indicate the actual, uh, our laboratory lot number for that particular standard that was run. So I have run both LAMPA and LSD on this to um, be able to see if I can differentiate them. And actually, at these orifice voltages, you can't. Hmm. Okay. We'll talk more about that in a second. So here we go. Uh, search label, uh, the search result is labeled here. And the spectrum was imported from Mass Center, so this is what you would get for your empirical formula search off of that last one. That would be the spectrum that you, that you would see. All right, and then you'd want to go to your match spectra. And in this case, you would go in and select the database. You, uh, when you click on that icon, you're going to select the database. And we store all of our libraries in this Mass Center data libraries because that's where we put it. You can put it wherever you'd like. Uh, but you'll see uh, there's actually some extra stuff in here, like the GHB blanks from last summer's project. And then the prep library, and there's four different orifice voltages of that. And these do say 20, 30, 60, and 90, even though it's kind of cut off in the screen there. And then the standard library, and we talked about what those are. So you would choose the library uh, to match your orifice one uh, spectrum that you did. Now remember, you had four of those. So if you're sitting here at a, at a 90 volt spectrum that you, that you did the, the uh, um, data reduction on and you brought that into to this particular program, then you would go in and you would choose either the prep library or the standard library depending on where you felt you needed to search or you may end up searching both. So you need to match the orifice one voltage to the library that you choose because remember the spectra are going to look different at each orifice voltage. So then you would double click on the library to load all the spectra and you get this screen up where all the spectra in the library are highlighted and then you click search and then you end up with a spectrum like this. And this is not the LSD but that's the trimethoprim one again. Um, but you see in the blue is your spectrum and in the red is the library spectrum. Now are there any differences in those? Intensity wise. Okay, but mass X on the on the uh, mass assignments on those peaks, they're pretty much right on. You'll see that that everything matches really well, and probably should be because it's probably you know searched against itself or something silly like that. But um, you will see here if you you know you will look for differences between your red spectrum here, which is your library, and then the blue spectrum, which is your your sample spectrum or the spectrum of your sample. Okay. Any questions on search from list at this point in time? All right. Now, this is, a, this is what we put in our case files. I remember since May 8th, um, we have been allowed to use the Dart and actually include it in our, you know, this data in our case files. And we're using it only for screening. I keep stressing that. But 
Um, we're going to print out the TIC from the chromatogram view. The idea there is to, to see what the intensity level was on your peaks. And your reviewer is going to look at that and go, you know, these peaks were like really tiny. Are you sure you had a good calibration? Or, you know, it's, it's you know, a check for your reviewer to be able to know whether you've got good data that you're working with or not. Um, print out the spectrum with the cocaine lock mass and the check standards to show that those are in the, the places where they're supposed to be. Uh, save the spectra as average, background subtracted, centroided, calibrated Joel DX files. Awful lot to say, and it's just as much manipulation to get it there. <laughs> the Schrader software tends to do that a little bit easier, as we saw this morning, and you'll, and you'll be able to compare that this afternoon. And then print out the search from list result for the 20-volt spectrum. Always the 20-volt spectrum because that's going to give us our protonated molecule or deprotonated molecule if you're in negative ion mode. And then print out other spectra or search results at other voltages enough to characterize the spectrum. How much information do you need to be able to say that you've got X drug versus Y drug? Do you need all four voltages, spectra at all four voltages? Well, maybe not. Maybe so. It kind of is up to you and obviously your reviewer as to whether you're going to, to need all that information in there. All right. So function switching advantages. Four spectra are collected every second. It's a lot of data to work with. Higher orifice one voltages result in more fragmentation, and that's why we're doing this. We want to be able to, to characterize these peaks we want to be able to know that it is, in fact, cocaine and not scopolamine by seeing the 182 versus the 138. Fairly simple. Uh, can lead to greater confidence for identification. We're not quite there yet, but if you include this data with all the other data that you're going to generate in this, in this particular case file, you know, here's another <laughs> pretty darn good screening technique here, pretty high dollar and a lot of information right in there. And then you're going to combine that with GC mass spec, FTIR, TLC, color test, whatever else that you're going to do to get to your normal result. And here's another piece of the, of the puzzle. Except for mixtures, spectra are reproducible. Mixtures are a real pain. Can be. Sometimes not. Sometimes so. The major disadvantages are the mixture spectra, and that can be good or it can be bad, you know, because the mixture spectra, it's, it's still really nice to be able to just go in there and say, well, I've got cocaine, heroin, and three different cutting agents. I don't know, whatever they may be. Diltiazem will show up and, you know, who knows what else. Um, less sensitivity in function switching. We talked about that. You're splitting your ionization between four functions, and that really does hamper your ability to get decent-sized peaks. But if you've got enough sample in there to begin with, it, it doesn't hurt you, but so bad. Finite database for searching. Library databases need to be developed. Well, that's something, you know, that maybe Peter and Roger and I and whoever else is on that project can, can get going. I mean, that's a, we're, we're possibly getting funding, maybe. maybe. Possibly. Maybe. <laughs> to actually have a... A database that could be, you know, much more uh, definitive. Um, you know, but right now, anyone who has a Dart pretty much is, is developing their own database, and that's what I've done. And, you know, I'm offering it to anybody here who has a Dart then and would like to have it. So, you know, that's a great start for other people. But, you know, considering the technology, I mean, you know, it was 2005, January 2005 that, that this came out, and, you know, it's, it hasn't been around all that long. So there's a lot of, you know, infancy that's being overcome kind of as we speak, although I'm not at, <laughs> back at work doing that. Um, so we're currently using it. Um, DX is, is our drug analysis section, drug examination, DX. TX would be tox, toxicology examination. Um, currently being used for screening, uh, as a screening tool. The validation took over a year to complete. Uh, the paper in Journal of Forensic Science won't come out till like July of 2009, is what I was told, but my paper on the validation that included a lot of this information has, was accepted um, about a month ago for publication, so you'll see that coming out hopefully at some point. And we had full approval then by our scientific advisory committee, who Dale Carpenter was 
one of the people who who did who was who was on our committee and I think that kind of put him over the edge to finally go and get one and get that to happen. So the validation, you know, we we um, looked at seven different drugs and we looked at at um, uh, the LOD to, to determine, and it's it's pretty bad. I mean, it's like half a half a milligram per mil uh, with the function switching, but you know, for drug work, that's not so bad because you typically have you know a lot to work with, so it's it's not so bad. Um, daily calibration data to show the stability of the instrument. I looked at at the uh, calibration that I do every day. I I, I take the um, uh, I start the dart. I run a peg, I run meth I run the lock masses, and um, then I run methyl stearate. And the methyl stearate has to be within three milli mass units of, uh, bless you, two fifty point no, two ninety nine point two two nine five zero. That's it, two nine five zero. So it's got to be within three milli mass units of that for me to accept the calibration. If that's, you know, if if, if it doesn't come in within three milli mass units, then I'm off either doing something. Could be cleaning that that um, taking the uh, orifice apart and cleaning that because it does it. Boy, it gets gunky back in there. Uh, but these are the things that you go through, you know, to make sure that you know it's like doing auto tune every morning. Uh, dart sampling methods. We looked at you know all the ones that I that I told you about, and you know we ended up with the methanol on the melting point tubes on the wands, and that, that works quite well for what we're doing. Now, one of the things, one of the big deals that I did was I took and blindly ran 553 case samples. Now, think about your, your, your labs and you've got your, your auto sampler vials sitting on your, on your uh, EI mass spec. And when people were done with those, they had, they, I asked them before they threw those away, to save those da those vials for me so that I could run them on the dart. Now we barcode all of our vials. So I had a way to, co to correlate the vial to the data that they ran through the barcode field. And we have all Agilent GC mass spec, so it's, it was easy to, to do that. Um, so I took those, those vials and the only thing I knew about it, them were that they, you know, that there was something in there. There was a, a solvent in there with something in there, and I ran those blindly on the on the dart. And then I, you know, looked at the data, and I looked for the highest scheduled drug, which would be the thing that you would typically be identifying in your normal case file. So I pulled that out, put that information into a into a uh, spreadsheet, and then I went to the GC mass spec. And the only thing I asked of people was to tell me which mass spec they ran it on so I could go find those data files easiest. And so then I pulled, uh, wrote a little macro to pull out the, the data for those, those runs and just give me, you know, the, the major peaks that were in there and looked for this, the highest scheduled drug on the GCMS run. Put those in the spreadsheet and then correlate them through the, through the barcode. And... What I found was of the 553 samples, the DART technology did not fail to identify the highest scheduled drug. And that's pretty good stuff. Now, that was a fun thing, and that was something that Peter and I were hoping to get. We, we had a little grant proposal up that we were going to try to do some of this between our labs to be able to get an, an inter-lab instead of intra-lab validation. And we didn't quite get funding for that for some reason. We'll give it another shot. Another shot. Yeah, um, but that's pretty pretty interesting I information. And um, there was one sample that was a, a bit tough to to um, to match up, but we were able to get it uh, after looking at the data, looking at the profile spectrum. There was an interference in a heroin sample, and but you were clearly able to see that there was an interference in there. And once you found where the where the peak was, you know, it, certainly that's what it was. Uh, selectivity study. I'm going to show you some of the data from that, um, which, you know, can you differentiate one drug from another if they're isomers? And that's a, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. I already told you, LSD and LAMPA, nope. But if you raise the orifice voltage to about 110 volts and scan down to about 20, 
you do see differences in like the 44, 43. You know, where you normally look for the difference between LSD and LAMPA, they show up. It's almost EI-like. But you got to really bump that orifice voltage up in order to do that. And then my favorite term, you know, we couldn't tell whether this was a, a robustness study or a ruggedness study, so we just call it robustness. And <laughs> we took and um, I made up, I made up unknowns for people, and I had everybody in the lab had to run. Um, there were like five of them, and so there would be like you know three sets of of data, and, and I needed to see if people on different days, different people, different days, could come up with the same result. And in general, that worked out really well. And it was very interesting because the two that really kind of failed were the ones who weren't as far along in the training of, you know, having had the practice of, of sampling and, and wanding and doing all that. And they're the ones who had troubles. And it was mainly because they had weak peg spectra. So they had weak calibrations and it threw their final um, unknown result, it, it threw it out of the five milli mass units. And they, so they got like nothing. Um, and as their result, and that wasn't the correct result. So it was interesting to be able to correlate that then, that most people who, would, who were further along in their training, you know, had that, um, had everything right, and then those people really didn't. But in general, it's, it showed that that was, you know, that that works quite well, that people, different people using that same solution could come up with the same, the same result. All right, so here's some boring data about the LLOD and, you know, looking at, at some of this. Uh, oh, actually, I, we, it was actually 0 0.05 milligrams per mil was our, was our final. Um, all right, the DART, the DART result versus the GCMS result. You know, what's interesting here is to look at, you know, the DART result tends to be richer data, richer in that, you know, it's a mixture. You get peaks at whatever drugs are in there. And you show up some things like, you know, I went to <laughs> this particular one, especially, I went to the person, I said, did you know you had quetiapine in your heroin? And they were like, huh? Because <laughs> number one, quetiapine, if you know, chromatographically comes out like even way past what you would do for heroin if you're not, you know, running your temperature incredibly long. And then quetiapine is also just a terrible chromatographer anyways. It, you need a bunch of it just to see the peak. So, you know, here it showed up beautifully on the dart, and, you know, well, I mean, they really didn't care because they had heroin. It was Schedule 1 versus Schedule 6. Well, I'm sorry, we have Schedule 6 in Virginia, which is, we won't go into that. Um, but anyways, I mean, the result that they were, were going to, to report anyway was going to be the heroin and not the quetiapine, but here it showed up in here. And, of course, papaverin, 6-mam, you know, I mean, those are things that you would see normally in there. And they might have shown up over here as little tiny peaks, but they didn't get integrated when I copied them out because they were under my threshold that I said, just kind of arbitrarily said um, the threshold for my macro for the integration on it. Um, but anyways, in general, things were, were better here than they were here. Um, the dimethyl sulfone, or as we say, the dimethyl cell phone, doesn't necessarily show up. I don't know why we didn't see it there. You know, normally you, you do actually see a peak for that. So anyways, that was just a, that's just a little tiny sampling of the 553 samples that were run. And that was a labor of love, let me tell you. But worked out all right. All right, so selectivity study. Here's some of the, you know, the old question of methamphetamine versus fentermine. Gosh, how do you tell them apart on the EI? Well, you run them on the dart because, you know, it's a no-brainer at 30 volts. You know, you get this peak here on the methamphetamine and you get this peak here on the fentermine. And when you look at the structures and how they lop apart, you know, they just make all the sense in the world and you're done. Isn't that lovely? So if for nothing else, if you want to run this for methamphetamine and be able to say that it's definitely not fentermine, here's the instrument to do that. Quick and easy. Real nice. Love this. That's good stuff. Cocaine scopolamine, same thing. We saw some data earlier from Chip with that. The 182 versus the 138. Okay. Uh, but if you have mixtures, be careful. Where do they come from? Where do those ions come from? Are they from this one or is it from something else that gave that? Ooh. These are the questions that you end up having. So that's why low orifice voltage definitely need that data because you definitely want this. 
And then if you show these up, then you have a good chance of saying that it's one versus the other. But, in, you know, there's, let's, let's face it, there isn't anybody in here, even the dilute and shoot lab here, isn't going to do one test. Forensically speaking, you're going to have more than one piece of data before you're going to make a conclusion. Everybody's going to do that. So you're not going to hang your hat merely, you know, merely on dart data and a couple lines. You're going to do a little bit more. Okay, but as a screening tool, and hopefully at some point for certain things, you know, if you've got um, tablets and, and Schedule II tablets, you know, we have to identify the major components in there. Well, how hard is it to take and, you know, lop off a little chunk and just throw them in there? And oxycodone and acetaminophen, you're done. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. Um, and then selectivity, you know, certainly once you get up to 90 volts, you know, I mean, look at how EI like this is, and EI like this is, and you can dis de definitely distinguish these. So now, once you get to this voltage and you're looking at this data, you're probably going to be able to say, well, I've got the 182 and the 138, but now I've also got several of these other ones. Now there may be some other peaks in here from other components and whatnot, but you know, once you get up to this voltage, you know, you're starting to get more unique. And that's the whole idea of having these extra orifice voltages doing the CID. LSD and Lampa at 90 volts, nope, cannot distinguish them. If you look really hard at those, you will not be able to tell the difference. All those masses are in basically the same spot. Nothing you can do. But if you raise that orifice voltage, go back, smack it harder, it works. All right, GHB screening. Um, Mark Bennett presented this at uh, AEFS this past year. So if you were there, you probably heard his talk, and, and I hope you enjoyed it because he's a terrific, he was a terrific student. And um, we actually got this, this slated for publication in January 2009 in, in J4Sci. So look for that. Cool stuff. Um, we spiked uh, 50 beverages, and, you know, we kind of went around the lab and said, you know, people bring in samples. <laughs> and so people donated all kinds of different things, and, and um, this is some of the things that we, that we ran here. Um, so we spiked uh, 50 different beverages with some GHB at levels that would be that would lead to impairment, if you will. I know that's kind of a strange term, but um, that's the way we dealt with it. But anyways, as drug chemists, you know, impairment we think of things probably differently than toxicologists do. So forgive me. Um, GHB was easily seen in all the drink matrices. It was real nice. Negative ion work here. Um, Gave better results than using the GHB color test that we're currently using, which is the Smith test, GHB test number three, the DEA test. It's, you know, didn't work all that great. And we do it in negative ion mode. Um, here's some ocean spray, cranberry juice, the blank. Okay, so that's what you see. And any guess what a lot of these peaks are due to? Oh, I'm not supposed to ask questions. Uh, let's see, sugars. <laughs> because that's probably what's in there. And then here's a spectrum of the um, 2 milligram per mil spike. We went from 1 milligram per mil to 4 milligram per mil and figured that would, you know, when you ramp that up, then um, you would have enough in there to, to um, have some impairment on the person who would be ingesting that particular drink. So the 103 ion here, which is GBA, GHB minus H minus, shows up really nicely right down in there. Cool data, fun stuff, good project, and my intern got a paper out of it. It's really cool. All right, any questions so far? Now we get to have, yes. Oh, wait, I get to turn this on. Is this meant to be a preliminary test then? You said you don't have any definite results from it. Is, you, you mentioned it's a screening technique. Yes. So this is not conclusive. We are not at that point yet okay. to be able to say that we can use this as an identification tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, And there's a lot of factors involved. As you, as you can see, the wanding, that's a big factor. The uh, mixtures, you know, dealing with that. And, and as you'll see from, from some of the adduct formation that we get here, dealing with a lot of extra peaks that are in there and kind of scratching your head and going, well... I've got this peak that says it's heroin, but what about this other peak up here? What am I going to do with that? And that's some of the things that you have to deal with because it's not like you know a nice, you know your GC mass spec gives you 
hopefully, a single component and a mass spectrum of that component. And you look at that and you say, you know, here's a molecular ion, here's all these fragments. If you have peaks up here above the molecular ion, you're going to have to scratch your head and go, well, where are those from? And our protocol says that you have to go and investigate what those are. So if they're noise, you do an ion reconstruct, and if they start showing up like this as noise in your chromatogram, well, then you print that out to show that you looked, but, you know, you still have to justify what those are. In this, you know, when, when we start looking at this, so we've got a peak here that may be our protonated molecule, but what's this? Where did that come from? And trying to figure out then, you know, where that came from is part of this thinking part that I was kind of alluding to before. So let's look at, any more questions? Here we go. Okay. How are we doing time-wise? I can't tell. I'm still an hour off. Okay. Um, spectral interpretation. Let's talk a little bit about some of the similarities, differences from electron impact, which I'm, I'm sure all of you are totally aware of and, and use all the time, versus the dart ionization. Your electron impact, your molecular ion is seen typically at uh, loss of an electron, right, n plus dot. Uh, it's unstable, it leads to extensive fragmentation at our, at our 70 EVs. You're, you know, you're putting a lot of energy into those electrons that are flying through there off of your filaments, and, you know, it's going to lead to a lot of fragmentation. Um, Usually the peak at highest mass, in, you know, excluding isotope peaks, that's your molecular ion. You look for logical neutral losses from that. And sometimes, you know, this little dude is kind of hard to find. Methylphenidate. Oof. That's a terrible one. Lorazepam. Because you lose that, that, what do you lose water off of? Lorazepam. That's another pain. Dark ionization is, you know, it's a soft ionization technique. It's much softer than smacking it over here with your sledgehammer. Uh, these tend to be very stable, very little fragmentation without help, you know, or raise the orifice voltage, and then you start to get fragmentation. So protonated and deprotonated molecules, loss of stable neutrals from here, and then we can use the search from list to find these, and that's really good. That's, that's really helpful. So let's just look at some examples. You know, here, and this, I, I pulled this out. I don't know how I, I came across this, but verapamil in, um, I'm not sure which library. It might be in our, our um, VAL, our Virginia library. But anyways, no, this was out of AEFS, I think. And anyways, it's an EI dip, direct insertion probe, right? And you think about that, and we think about the dart, and you use your little wand, and you stick it in there. That's like a direct insertion probe in the dart. And I thought, oh, wow, what a great, you know, here, let's compare these two. Well, this is a prime example. You know, you're going to get fragmentation somewhere in the middle of this thing that's going to, you know, leave you with this big old 303 here and not much, you know, no molecular ion out here. If you've ever had to analyze this, you'll, you know, and absolutely re needed to have that, well, you're going to be in real trouble because you're not going to see that molecular ion. And then you look at the dart and look at how nice and soft the ionization is and you get your protonated molecule and, up, oh, you even get your major fragment. Lovely stuff. Okay. Uh, I don't have the orifice voltage for that, but it's probably a low orifice voltage, probably 20 or 30 volts on that. All right. Um, some other things that, that you see in, in dart spectra, you know, your stable neutral losses. Look, at here's a nice water loss off of that. And don't you think there's a whole bunch of places where that can occur? And look at how big that ion is if you think about it in terms of, you know, ways to get to a particular ion. If you start with this one and, and you're going to fragment down to this one, there's a number of ways to get there. It ought to be a fairly big peak. Make sense? That's what the whole mass spec calculator is. Uh, show of hands, how many people know about mass spec calculator, the program? Oh, my gosh. We got some educating to do today. All right. Um, all the usual isotope clusters. If you can't pick out a chlorine and a bromine pattern, we're in real trouble because spectral interpretation here, you've got to be able to pick those out. Okay, and that's just stuff that, you know, you've got to know kind of up front. If, if, because even if you're doing the elemental composition, you know, you've got to be able to know that you've got one chlorine here to deal, to deal with and add that into your uh, range of, of atoms that you're looking for when you calculate your empirical formula. 
So, you know, to be able to pick this out, you know, you ought to be able to pick out a single chlorine and certainly a, a, uh, two chlorines, you know, because it'll be, it'll be a three to one pattern and a three to two pattern for that. And then bromines, you know, there aren't many drugs especially that have more than one bromine. Um, maybe if you get to some of the rat poisons and things like that, uh, I think there's a couple on there, but you know, a single bromine you ought to be able to pick out. So here's chlorpheniramine and bromphenyramine, and you can see that the clusters that have those particular halogens on there show up beautifully, and it's standard mass spec stuff, okay? Standard interpretation stuff. All right, so methamphetamine, you know, we look at these losses. We already looked at this one a little bit. Um, you know, we're going to lop this this neutral off here, and we get down to 119. Um, fentermine, we're going to lop it off here, and we get to 133. We can differentiate those every day of the week. It is slick, absolutely slick, and that's, I'm telling you, I love that part. Um, heroin, we have this fragment here, um, loss of this group giving us <laughs> this 310, and it's interesting the labels that come up on these because uh, this 310.1439 shows up in your search from list result as fluoxetine. And he starts going, oh, wow, there's, you know, there's fluoxetine in it. Well, it's not, actually. It's from the heroin itself, but it labels it as fluoxetine because it's within 5 millimass units. The fluoxetine empirical formula is within 5 millimass units of this particular ion that showed up. So that's one of the things you've got to kind of sit back and go, well, okay, maybe that's not it. Okay? And recognize that you have you know, this peak at heroin and this little peak at apomorphine, which may in fact be apomorphine if you lop these guys off of heroin and get to that, but that's the, the loss that you, use, that you get uh, that particular ion. So, you know, interpretation of this is, is um, very similar to what you would do in, in EI interpretation. If you've done any EI interpretation, and if you haven't used Mass Spec Calculator Pro, you're missing out. All right, but then we start getting into weird stuff. And, you know, dimers and trimers and adducts, oh my. And things get kind of weird once we start doing this. Now, uh, hydrocodone acetaminophen, the typical lore tabs. I mean, everybody's seen these, had to deal with these. Uh, acetaminophen here, the, the M plus H is beautiful right there. Uh, but you notice this large 303 here, we got this little peak labeled codeine down here. And of course, hydrocodone and codeine are isomers, right? We can't differentiate them unless we have something else to, to look for. And, you know, but we have this really large 303. And what we find out is that, you know, 151 plus 151 is what? 302 plus 1 protonated gives us 303. So that's actually our acetaminophen dimer. And this only occurs at low orifice voltages. Keep that in mind. All right, so here's our acetaminophen dimer at 303. And if we do the calculations out of the theoretical isotope pattern, um, Chip, did you write that one too? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> um, the, um, this particular program will, is part of the tools that come with, with the, um, with the uh, DART system. You can do essentially the same thing. Put an empirical formula in here and calculate it, and it'll tell you what the isotope ratio should be. I guess that's all part of the elemental composition for program also. Um, but you'll see that the, you know, the, the 304 was, should be theoretically around 18.4, and it actually came in at 19.1. So we know that's pretty good correlation there in a sedimentophen dimer. Now, uh, like I said, at low orifice voltages, the dimer shows up very nicely. Um, at 30 volts, it's, it's a lot smaller. But once we get to 60 volts, the dimer falls apart. Too much energy. I mean, dimers are pretty weak bonded, right? These little adduct things that we're creating, they're not real bonds. They're just kind of stuck together. And then the, uh, the duct tape doesn't quite hold them together once you get enough energy in there to, to smack them apart. So once you get to this orifice voltage, then things start to really fall into place as to, to what your spectrum looks like. And it becomes simpler to look at. This one here could be terribly confusing if you're not cognizant and keeping yourself aware of, of what's going on here. All right, we go back to that original 20-volt one, 
And we look and we see this peak out here. And the question is, what is this? What could this be, pray tell? So we do elemental composition on it, and it comes up with this. And you know, I pretty much looked at it and said, well, that's probably the best match. And you know, so what is that? C26H31N2O5. Well, if we take hydrocodone or coating, because remember they're isomers, empirical formula isomers. If we take those and we add acetaminophen, the empirical formula of that, just add the numbers, doop, 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 add an H, and look at that. We've now explained this. So we've got the acetaminophen protonated molecule. We've got the dimer here. We've got the hydrocodone slash codeine down here. And now we've got an adduct of the two of them. Interesting information. Oh, I love the faces. They're all like, whoa, how did they do that? And this is the kind of data that you have to look at. And this is why I said before, you've got to think. Because you've got to, you know, if you're going to look at this data and you want to evaluate this data and be able to say, you know, what do I have? What am I going to do with this? You know, you'd like to have a good idea of what you've got. And, you know, you may not be looking at all of these little ones down here, but certainly a large ion at that mass, you'd probably have to scratch your head and go, you know, that ought to be something. What could it be? All right. Salsalate. Anyone ever hear of salsalate? It's actually disalicylic acid. It's an, it's an analgesic, anti-inflammatory, and for some whatever reason, we had a standard of that in our, in our room. So... You know, as part of the of running these uh, standards and, and pharmaceutical preparations to see what we had, you know, this was one of them that showed up. Okay, well, this is in methanol at orifice 20. This is the spectrum that you get. Okay, molecular weight 258, and you know, you not much information that you can get there. Certainly, you know, 258 I don't see much showing up down in there. So. You know, we knew what this was, obviously, and you know, because it was a standard. So, started looking at it and going, you know, this would be a great candidate to do the ammonia addicts on. So we got a swab with some ammonium hydroxide and we ran it, and um, dart it. You know, ran that through the dart, and here's our empirical formula. And look at this: if we add in our as our charge carrier, if we add ammonia in our charge carrier, carrier, and search from list. Bingo, here it is. Okay, well, that's helpful. But then again, you know, here we are. We got all these other peaks. What are they? Where'd they show up from? So now you get to do chemistry, and that's where this is so much fun. It's good stuff here. All right, so we have this set of peaks right here, 258, 259. And I, I will admit that I would never have solved this puzzle without Chip, because I called him up and I said, what the heck is going on? And he's like, well, it does this and does this. Said, That's normal stuff. And I'm like, oh. And then I sat down and went through it and, and you know figured it out and said, OK, I agree. So if we look at the 259.0634, that is, in fact, our M plus H. So we have M plus H, and we have the ammonia addict. And then we have this big guy here at well, it's not M plus dot. It's actually M plus ammonia minus water plus. And as, he, as Chip will tell you, oh, that's just normal ammonia CI. Well, of course, I had never done ammonia CI, so this was a new thing for me, and you know that's how we get to learn things, because you do new things. So OK, so we've got those taken care of. Well, what about the rest of these ions? All right, here's our salicylic acid. Plus ammonia plus water, H, 138. OK, that fits. OK, we can look at this, do the elemental composition on it. You'll see that you know if you add everything up here, everything adds up nicely. Love that. Um, you can look at all these other ions and you know add everything up, add all your carbons, all your nitrogens, hydrogens, oxygens, and you come up with an empirical formula, and that matches nicely. Same thing, this is not M plus dot, but it's all of these guys all added all up together. Okay? Add those two, subtract those. Okay? Isn't this fun? Math is awesome, huh? People are like, holy mackerel, what are you thinking? I don't know why I would want one of these, because it's fun. All right. 259, same thing. Okay. 
So now we've got to look at some of these others because we've, you know, we've identified you know, some of these ions, but let's look at some of these others and can we do anything with those? Well, here's our salicylate plus H right there, kind of lopping off in through here, plus H. Okay, that makes sense. Here's our, oh, look at that, salicylate dimer. And then we have this cluster out here. Well, what could, what could that cluster be? <laughs> salicylate trimer. Add them up. All right, the trimer plus the ammonia. And, of course, our trimer plus water plus ammonia. And that one took a little bit to figure out because it wasn't plus ammonia minus water. It was plus water. But for whatever reason, they all seem to make, you know, I mean, you, you go through uh, elemental compositions and that's what you come up with. Hmm. Okay. And once again, you go through these and, and um, oh, I'm sorry, a little quick. You go through these and you'll, you'll see that they all add up. And those are the good hits. All right. Uh, hydroxyzine. This was an interesting one because you got your nice protonated ion right here. And then you had this little cluster over here. So the, the question is, what is this? And you look, and this is, of course, chlorinated. Got to pick that out right away. Remember, hydroxyzine is chlorinated. There we are. So this must have something to do with the hydroxyzine. But look at, I mean, it's like, you know, 150 Daltons above the protonated molecule. What the heck is that from? How strange. So you put on your little, you know, forensic chemistry little hat there and you say, oh, let's try and figure this out. <laughs> All right, chlorinated. So you do empirical formula and if you leave, you know, if you don't um, constrain it very well, then you get a huge list like this and you start going, uh, uh well, what am I going to do with that? So, you know, now what? And so now you look at the composition list and you, you say, well, are any of these terribly unreasonable? Are any of those like so totally off the wall that I could just scratch them right off and, and not worry about those? So you look at the list here and then you start scratching off and apply chemistry logic. It's always good to do that. All right. So you look here and you say, you know, here's our starting empirical formula and this is what it could be for that. But C18, you know, come on. We're not going to just add, you know, whatever, eight, eight more nitrogens and... I don't know, five oxygens and not having, a, you know, that just doesn't make sense at all. So you kind of just start scratching things off. And if you're wrong, you go back and do it again. But, you know, at least you got to start somewhere. So you start scratching those off. Not enough carbons. Over here, too many nitrogens or too many oxygens have been added to our empirical formula. If we're saying that this is an addict, then that was kind of an assumption that we made from the beginning, is that this must be some kind of addict because there's hydroxyzine that's chlorinated. This thing's chlorinated. It must be hydroxyzine plus something else. So, you know, we start looking at that going, well, you know, too many nitrogens or oxygens. It's hard to add that up and really feel comfortable with that. So you go down to the bottom down here, not enough nitrogens or oxygens or too many carbons, and you just kind of start sitting there and scratching your head and going, you know, some of these just don't make sense. Apply chemistry logic. So you're left with three of these now. Okay, so here we are down to three of these. And you look at those and you go, well, that's a lot of nitrogens to add. And... You know, for, for either one of those, although you're only adding three to here, but there's a whole bunch of carbons that you're adding here, you know, it just doesn't seem that logical. Maybe. <laughs> hmm. So you end up with, with this one empirical formula. So you say, okay, to yourself, well, now what? So then you start looking and, you know, forensically speaking, you pull out all your references and you pull out the 2003 PDR and you look up that Vistaril um, monograph for the hydroxyzine pamoate, and you look at the inert ingredients, magnesium stearate, sodium lauryl sulfate, starch, and su <gasps> sucrose. What about that? And you go, hmm, what does that look like? So you go into Merck index, and you pull that, spe that little picture up there, and you start scratching your head and going, huh, reckon about that, because then you go back to your original spectrum, and you go, look at this. There's a whole bunch of peaks in here that match the sucrose spectrum. 85, 127, 145. I had to draw that 289 in so that it would fit with that. But, you, I mean, you know, there's quite a few of those sucrose peaks in there. And you kind of go, wow, what about sucrose? So you take a guess. And this is my best guess. 
you know, I've, I have no way to confirm this, but, you know, it seems to work. If you take the hydrolyzed sucrose, C6H12O6, and you add that to hydroxyzine empirical formula, then you get C27H39N2O8Cl. Well, that's close, but let's subtract water. Because, you know, it's chemistry. We could do this kind of stuff. And you're still off by one, but then you've got to remember to add a hydrogen back because you're protonating it. And don't you know, it should be at 537.2367 and 2336. Hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? This is the fun stuff that you do. And I, you know, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've never had challenges like this. And this is, you know, I mean, this keeps me going, you know. I mean, I've been doing this work for 27 years, and I'm like, this is cool stuff here. I can do this for a while longer. As long as they don't make me do cases, I'm in good shape. <laughs> Did I say that? Edit that out. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this was another one that, that Chip helped me with because I was totally stumped by this. Um, codeine with acetaminophen. If you run a codeine standard, you get a spectrum that looks like this. And you know, here's a water loss off of the, off of the protonated um, codeine, which is normal. You've got an OH hanging out there. So that lops off, and, and you know, that's really beautiful. But if you ran this as the mixture you know, in the, the um, Tylenol-3 codeines, okay, acetaminophen codeine mixtures, You'd look at the spectrum and you'd go, well, the 282 is like really tiny. And that just doesn't make sense. So I did a little study. I took a, a solution of codeine standard, and then I started mixing it with acetaminophen. Just started adding acetaminophen and measured amounts to it so that I could see what happened. So I started out with codeine at, at 30, and all these, all these spectra are at 30 volts, so we don't, don't mess with that. But here is codeine to acetaminophen 20 to 1. 20 to 1 codeine and you start seeing the acetaminophen show up. And that still looks like codeine. Okay, that's good. And then as we get to 10 to 1, you know, we still have basically the same codeine spectrum, so we're okay with that. But our acetaminophen's starting to come up. But now codeine at uh, 5 to 1 to acetaminophen, this is getting really big, and you notice how the 282 is now dropping off kind of like a rock here. And as you keep going further, when you get to 1 to 1, the 282 is like magically disappearing. And I like sitting there going, whoa. But let's put it in terms of the amount of energy that you have to ionize this codeine. And if all you had to do was, was ionize codeine, then you would easily get this fragment to occur because you've got, you know, maybe a little excess at 30 volts. This was, yes, yeah, 30 volts you may have a little bit of excess energy in there that's going to promote that fragmentation, okay, if it's just coating. But once you start adding another thing in here, and this is the problem with mixtures, once you start adding something in, you don't have as much energy to ionize both things. You're kind of splitting that energy up, if you will. And as you do that, you don't have as much then to create this fragment and it tends to start to disappear once you get a bunch of that energy going over here and in here, this starts to suffer. Now, you can bring that back up very easily. Raise your orifice voltage. But this took me a while to figure this out, and thank you, thank you Chip, for explaining this to me. Hopefully I did that okay in being able to explain that. Um, but this is one of the reasons why you have issues when you start mixing drugs together you know, or you have them as, as your mixture in your sample in the first place, you know, you don't know. You put it in methanol and you hope for what you're going to get. And that's why that low orifice voltage is terribly important to you because hopefully you'll just show up this and this and feel real good about that. And then raise that orifice voltage and start promoting this so that you're not being, not suffering, if you will, from this phenomenon here. All right. Now, when Mr. Arakawa, who was the Japanese engineer that came in to do the, to do the um, uh, MCP replacement, he spent 
oh, about two weeks at my lab. And that was like within a month or so after he had come over here from Japan. So he didn't speak a lot of English, and I spoke no Japanese. And, but we were able to communicate because we had this thing that we were, you know, that was kind of the common ground, which was the mass spec, and that was really kind of cool. And, but one day he's sitting there, and, and I mean, he had spent hours, and he's tweaking on it. And this is before we figured out that it was actually the MCP that, was, that was, had warped and cracked. And he had spent hours tweaking. And I mean, this is a man who was fully trained at the factory to, you know, and came in to get this instrument up and running because it was just, <laughs> something was weird. And then we ended up finding out. So at one point, though, it was getting late in the day, and he stood up and he rolled down his sleeves and he buttoned him up and he looked at me and went, today is done. And that was it. It was time to go home. So I, it's my favorite, my favorite story because, you know, I end that, all of my presentations now with today is done. So, <laughs> all right. Here we go. Questions? Somebody, anybody? Question from a non-chemist. <laughs> um, if you're to get funded to create this library that you mentioned? Yes. Does that mean that everyone who has to use the library later has to use all of the same settings that you used when you run your samples? And Not necessarily. Do you, and do you end up standardizing the use of the DART in the field by creating your library? Well, you do. You do. I mean, we had to start somewhere, and we had to do something. So that's where we are. So if you, if you want to use our libraries, you pretty much have to use our system. And once again, there's, you know, understand the advantages and disadvantages as I pointed them out. But, you know, I, I think we're, you know, for what we're doing and for, for what we're using it for right now, it seems pretty good. It gives you a broad spectrum of data over a broad spectrum of, of compounds that you, can, that you can analyze with it. Maybe I can put in a little bit more on that of what we've proposed. Mm -hmm. um, and I can talk some more about this tomorrow. We've proposed in terms of library matching because there are a variety of things that people are using this for. Like FBI is using it for identifying stuff because they get <laughs> stuff in an envelope. It could be anything on the face of the planet. So they've gone through looking at everything they can lay their hands on. Their motto is, we will dart anything, and they mean it. I've been up there darting fish tails and stuff that we collected at lunch. Um, we've got... The Ames folks here are doing inks. Um, we've got probably the dominant one that we've run across is people doing drug chemistries. We do toxicology stuff. So what we've proposed is to try and collect up as many of these people as we can. We've got, I think, five. We've also got um, Jim Laramie involved in the um, proposal, who's more the exotic explosives and chemical agent kind of stuff. Um, and look at what all of these groups have collected to see is there a way we can construct a database that would allow for people to not lose data that they've already collected. If there is the necessity to standardize on something, you know, let's try and find a way that we navigate our way to a standard for a database that preserves as much data that everybody has and then start building from there. Um, it also would be selecting a um, database architecture and software situation to try and meet as many of those needs as we can. I think we've got a pretty good candidate for that if, if this all pans out. But I have one question for you, too. You're, oh, okay. You're using it for screening. Yes. Um, it's a tad of a trick question, because I only I know of one laboratory that has taken the plunge towards using it for confirmatory data. Are you aware of anybody else? Houston? Yeah, Houston's the only one that I'm aware of. And they're only using it for one compound. Yeah, one compound and one particular formulation. And, and that's alprazolam. Even that makes me a little queasy, but... There are no other drugs that have an empirical formula the same as alprazolam. Which helps. I mean, yeah. I mean, that they, they picked it very deliberately. There was alprazolam, it's tablets, so they've got both inscription evidence as well as the DART evidence mm -hmm. for confirmation. But mm -hmm. I mean, are you aware of anybody else who's made any... I don't think there's... I mean, I don't know who else has darts in... in a it's drug still, you know, it's only been a couple of years that it, it, yeah. Yeah. it has been, well, you guys have pioneered all this, but mm -hmm. it's not done yet. Yeah. I don't know of anybody else yeah. I mean, who has one that's doing specifically, you know, the, the forensic drug chemistry applications besides yeah. us. Yeah. And, and down in Houston. And they, 
like I said, they, they, they're only at one compound at this yeah. moment in time. But, I mean, they did all the validation toward that one compound, and it was kind of a no-brainer. But, I mean, if you take diazepam, you know, there's like 70 different, should you say 70 different compounds oh, yeah. or mean, something could, like that that could have that same empirical formula? Yeah. So how do you get all those standards to run them all? And that's when you start talking identification. You know, if you can find the unique ones, you're done. That's simple. But it's these ones that have, you know, other things that could show up. You know, do that elemental composition calculator on, <laughs> on any formula and see how many show up. Go into NIST and look. Well, that's part of the contemplation on the database as well is particularly like for what FBI has been trying to use it for of identification of stuff, that it's not really by any particular exact mass, it's by a pattern of mm -hmm. masses. And how do you construct a database that can allow you to do both of these things, like the search from list that's really only looking by mm -hmm. exact mass and by patterns of masses that could be a pattern of masses that's suggestive of bread flour over anthrax. I mean, that, that kind of pattern differentiation, so. Amanda, did you have a question? I just wondered for um, drug analysis, why you would go through all the trouble of doing something like Alpraislam when the GC mass spec works perfectly fine? I don't necessarily use it specifically for Alpraislam. But for but it normal would be drugs, we, we I'm just do, wondering but... why um, people would go through all the trouble when GC mass spec works for pretty much everything. Uh, let's put it in terms of, of GC mass spec. Uh, you tell me how you would run Alpraislam on the GC mass spec. Talk into the microphone. I dilute and shoot it. Okay. What do you shoot? How many injections does it take? Just A one. blank and a sample? And a standard. And a standard. Yep. Three things. Okay. How long is your run? Um, for that, it's about 15 minutes. Hmm. So 45 minutes total? Yep. Plus cool down time? I can do that in about five minutes as a trained dart operator. I can do that same analysis and give you that result in five minutes. How Is much that do they cost to get the whole setup, though, if you already have GC mass specs? Well, we're like talking about, yeah, we're talking about a huge outlay. There's no question. It's two hundred twenty thousand dollars with a with a nitrogen generator and a tank and, and everything else that you'll want to have with it. Uh, get the UPS too if you didn't. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> just a good idea. I'm not. I don't represent Joel, but <laughs> it's just a good idea. Um, but it, you know, it's not the run of the mill. It's it's not the run of the mill things that makes it so useful. It's the it's the weird stuff that we have found it most useful. You know, it's the things that don't respond to the other testing. It's the things that, you know, are kind of off the wall that we have found the best application for. Most people don't, you know, most people don't use it for their, for their normal casework because although they're all trained and had to go through all the training, you know, most people are afraid to use something with a lot of mouse clicks and doing all this kind of stuff. So I've got a few people who use it a lot it's like, oh, you know, they're always in there. But other people avoid it like the plague because they'd rather take the time to do the GCMS rather than going through and, you know, feeling comfortable about the dart. The other side of the coin is, and Peter, I'll get to you in a second. The other side of the coin is getting up on the witness stand and defending this. Now, we haven't gotten there yet. No one's taken dart data to court yet, but word on the street is that the FBI uh, have a, a Daubert hearing that they're getting all their ducks in a row to present this. And I haven't heard when or, you know, what the details are on that. I've just heard kind of rumors about that. So once that happens, I hope we get, you know, word out, um, especially on the users group, that, that that's happened and that we can uh, start applying that and whatever is going to come from that. Um, Pete first. Sorry. I think one thing to maybe add on that of why I'll praise Lamb this time around is is because there's nothing really else for it. It's you got to start someplace on the Daubert hearing, and I think that's a question I'd have for the group here. I know of at least one state that before they would go purchase a new piece of equipment, 
they require on up the chain that it be demonstrated that this piece of equipment would survive a Daubert challenge. Does anybody have anything along those lines in your systems in terms of justifying a new piece of equipment? As I've been told, Colorado Bureau of Investigation is the one that's told me that, that they, they would, in order to justify a new piece of equipment, they'd have to be demonstrated that this would, would survive a Daubert challenge. So, I mean, it's got to start someplace, and obviously, I mean, hopefully the FBI case is a federal case. I mean, only assume that it's a federal one, but it may not be. Yeah. I mean, they do stuff for state systems. But that's, it, it, it worries me on that, because there's, I, I can see a number of ways that an enterprising lawyer would attack that one. Mm -hmm. um, and could could be very successful in, in shooting it down. And the problem is, is when it gets shot down once, It'll be a long time recovering from it. Mm -hmm. If it survives it, that's a great step in the right direction. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even if we're not using this for confirmation, and I'm not a forensic lab, but you guys are, but uh, the, I, I, we have GCMS and LCMS products that we sell too. But the, the, the nice thing about the DART is the first thing we run, any sample that comes in the door, no matter what it is, we run it on the DART first, and that tells us what other technique to use. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the same thing from the FBI lab. They said, you know, this really saves them an awful lot of time trying to figure out which method to use to, con to confirm what's sure. in there. You know, if, if you get some random white powder coming in the door, there you might miss it depending on which GCMS protocol or LCMS protocol you want to use. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you know right away that it's got X in it, then you know to, to go run the test for X, and that puts you a lot of saves you an awful lot of time and trouble. Right. Uh, uh, regarding the databases, uh, what Pete's talking about is is really a pretty reasonable thing. The, the just for what it's worth, NIST went through this sort of thing years ago when they were trying to standardize MSMS -MS spectra taken on different kinds mm -hmm. of machines and. Mm -hmm. Uh, without going into uh, what could be easily be a two-hour long lecture for me that you don't want to hear, MSMS spectra vary a lot just depending on what kind of mass spectrometer you use, whether it's a triple quadrupole or an FTMS or, or an ion trap. But uh, recently, NIST has really settled down on collecting a, a library of MSMS spectra, and even though they are taken on different machines, uh, the information has turned out to be tremendously useful, and Steve Stein has... has uh, uh, been advocating the, the the idea that these things are not as different as we thought they were. Uh, we understand what some of the parameters are, but what really needs to be done is is to you know get the databases and compare them in the different labs. Uh, you know the, the time of flight's a pretty good starting case because there are fewer parameters to adjust there. What's more interesting is uh, you know the, the effects that Bob's talking about there about what happens to things in mixtures and what this information all means. Uh, but it's a very reasonable thing to do, I think, because we've got very narrow x-axis data points, and even if the y-axis data points are a lot more variable, you have a pretty, a pretty clear pattern there. The other thing I will, uh, mentioned uh, is uh, I thought it was made it into the uh, distribution packets, but apparently it didn't. I've got a chart that lists different kinds of compound classes and what they do when you run Dart on them. Uh, so I'll, if I, we don't have that, I'll make sure we get a it's just a one-page crib sheet. You know, if you're looking at sugars, expect this. If you're looking at acids, expect that. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be very helpful uh, in trying to figure out how to plan an experiment. Right. And the last comment before I turn off the microphones, a lot of these things may be unfamiliar to you guys that do GCMS because EI is very predictable, but these are really kinds of common considerations for anybody who does LCMS, and that's becoming more and more popular. Dimer formation, uh, yeah. in-source fragmentation, uh, adduct formation, all that stuff is the bread and butter for the LCMS guys. So it's not really so unusual. It's just different if you're not used to looking at it right. from a GCMS point of view. That's right. And that, you know, that's that's an incredibly important point because there's a lot of labs that are going to that and, and getting new instruments that, that are beyond that EI mode that we are all, you know, that all we, we all know and love. I have a question about your calibrating that you did um, on that. On was on one of your earlier slides where you had run the peg and then you ran, I think, maybe the methamphetamine or something, and then mm -hmm. you ran another peg because you didn't like the intensity of yes. the first one. Yep. So can you do that all the time? Like it doesn't matter where in your series of of shots or runs that you do that you calibrate and if it's not calibrated the way that you want it in the beginning it's okay because you can calibrate it in the middle and then reprocess the data oh sure or yeah you could you know 
think think about it in terms of a data file is is just a collection of information and you're putting whatever you want to put in there, whether it's multiple pegs, um, multiple lock mass and, and, and check standards, multiple samples. You know, most of the things that, that we run are, you know, someone has one sample to run and that's it. But if you had, you know, five tablets and you weren't sure what was in them and you wanted to run all of those, they're all in one case in one item, you could run all of those and just separate them with a little bit of space and time um, you know, and then be able to go back and, and reprocess those those spectra, you know, all in one data file, and you would you could have your calibration, you know, at any point in there if you wanted to run your peg at any point, and you can go back and you know and recalculate and do whatever you want. Once you get the data collected, it's just math, okay, and then the data file really remains unchanged. You don't you don't mess with it at all. When I was down at Georgia Tech with Facundo Fernandez, we had about 150 different tablets and capsules that were uh, counterfeit anti-malarials. And uh, actually, they had no idea what was in these things. It turned out to be everything from Tylenol to rubber polymerizer. But uh, we had so many of these things to run that we ran them all in just a few data files. And between each tablet or capsule, we ran one peg spectrum. And then we just plot out a, a picket fence chromatogram of where the peg is. And every, in between those, you have an index. You know, you can count the number of peg peaks, and that's tablet number five or capsule number 47. Mm -hmm. So that made it a whole lot easier just to keep track of what was right around sample peg, sample peg, sample right. peg, and so on. And then you've got lots and lots of reference peaks in there if you want to. Right. And, the, you know, once again, it's, it's not, you know, this system is not automated um, until you get to the auto dart, and even that is, is you know, isn't probably you know what you what you would think of as, as an auto sampler and and you know putting a rack of, of uh, vials on there and just having it run individual data files for each vial, you know, you have the ability to run more than one thing in any one data file, and it's up to you to remember what you did because <laughs> there's no other way to check. <coughs> Bless you. Does that answer it? Okay. Any other questions? All right. Uh, so we're about 45 minutes beyond where we were supposed to be. But we started a half hour late, so that means we're only 15 minutes late. So let's take a 10-minute break and meet down in the lab. And I've got uh, some unknowns to run. And we're going to set up the function switching and have somebody wand them in. And I'll probably do the data manipulation because that would probably be more efficient. All right, thank you.